Welcome, welcome back. Welcome back. All right, we're gonna talk about gadgets. Gadgets. Um, when I started with the CEA six years ago, we were talking to folks about uh, accelerometers, putting accelerometers in houses that cost about $10,000 a piece. How would we have a relationship with the homeowner so we could keep track of that? Um, we are just worlds away from that technology, amazing technology. I'm gonna go right to um, our first speaker because we, um, okay, I have to get to, thank you. You're still seeing my slideshow here. I had lo a lot more fun putting this together than the technical slideshows. Um, just looking at visions of technology and um, things that have come true with, of course, Gene Roddenberry being way ahead of his time. Our, our group is very diverse and um, with sensors and, and uh, accelerometers and all kinds of things that, that can inform the industry. And of course, from our perspective, we are interested in very definitely after an earthquake or, or during an earthquake in, in understanding ground motions, you know, in making better maps. But these folks are talking about things that can happen beforehand that can inform our modeling, inform um, what we're all doing. And so I want to give them about 10, 10 minutes each and then really open up for dialogue. So I'll flash you all a one minute when you're getting, when you're getting close. So we're going to start with... Um, how is technology useful in measuring ground motion and building performance relevant to earthquake insurance providers and policyholders? So they're going to tell us about what we're doing. And then, of course, collectively, we're interested in all of your thoughts about how we can make this useful. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Richard Allen. Thank you. We were just debating who was first, and I was told I was third. <laughs> okay, so thank you, first of all, for the invitation to participate in this. My name's Richard Allen. I'm a seismologist as opposed to a seismic engineer, and I say that just because we have a, an array of seismic engineers up here, and as a seismologist, we're just trying to figure out how we might use this technology, uh, my shake, to facilitate some of the questions that engineers are asking. Um, and so, so that's what I'm going to introduce. I'm going to talk about this project, My Shake, which is using smartphones to record the ground shaking um, that occurs uh, in earthquakes. Okay, so the problem, first of all, what is the problem? I don't think I need to explain what the problem is. We have very few sensors um, that are actually measuring the response of buildings in an earthquake. In fact, I recently learned on the Berkeley campus that we have this incredibly detailed structural analysis of a relatively new building that was done, a lot of modeling, but nobody actually then went and put a sensor in the building, so there's actually now gr no ground truth of these incredibly sophisticated models. And so the thought here is, what we really need is many, many sensors in many, many places um, in order to do that. And of course, it turns out that we actually already have that. We have many, many sensors um, in many, many places. You can actually see them in this picture right there, right there. Just a random photo, and I think there's about five people you can actually see them holding their smartphones. Now, of course, the ones that they're holding aren't actually very useful um, to us, but these people are actually um, part of our network um, in the sense that they're then going to take these phones and they're going to put them in in all of these places, and they're going to put them down on their nightstands, they're going to put them down on their desks, um, and then there's the potential for them to actually provide data of how these buildings, how the infrastructure is shaking um, in the course of an earthquake. So that's the concept um, behind my shake at this point. Now, of course, the challenge is that unfortunately people insist on carrying their smartphones around with them much of the time. And the motions that people put their phones through are much more significant than the motions they'll experience in many earthquakes. And so we have to be able to distinguish an earthquake shake from an everyday shake on the phone. That's the key um, uh, uh, piece that, or the key challenge that we need to get past. And we've actually managed to do that with a classifier analysis that runs on a single phone. This just sort of illustrates how you separate earthquakes from non-earthquake uh, type shaking using two second windows of data um, on the phone. And in our testing, that has about a 93% success rate. So 93% of the time, you can accurately determine when your phone moves, whether this was an earthquake or something else. And of course, once it, a phone moves, it can connect um, to our backend servers where we can confirm that it actually is an earthquake. And now we really know it is an earthquake and we can collect data. So that's the idea um, behind my shake. So the idea is to build a global smartphone seismic network. 
and where we're collecting data from all of your phones, there's at least as many smartphones in the room as there are people. Um, when, when they detect an earthquake, we confirm the earthquake in the cloud. When a phone triggers, it collects a total of five, at the moment, it collects five minutes worth of data from a minute before the earthquake to four minutes after the earthquake. That's a parameter that we can change on the fly. And it uploads that data to a, a backend archive that we can then use for any kind of research activity that we're interested in. Okay, and of course, one of those potentially is to actually understand the distribution of ground shaking in an earthquake and how that earthquake has affected um, the buildings. So we've rolled this out. This is actually um, already operational. We rolled it out almost exactly two years ago. We were stunned by the number of people who downloaded it. I mean, this is just citizen scientists just downloading the app, turning their phone into a, a seismometer. Frankly, we give very little to them at this point. It's just, it's completely shocking to me that this many people um, have the app on their phone. Uh, right now, today, there's about 20,000 users, and we've had a total of 300,000 uh, downloads. I was actually at a meeting in London last week, and I looked it up, and there are actually 300 users in the UK. There are no earthquakes in the UK, but there are 300 users. The power of this approach is, is really shocking. So very quickly, to give you a sense of what we then get from this, um, this is just a map that shows the phones that were running MyShake um, when the Borrego Springs earthquake occurred um, uh, back in 2016. Similar, we have a similar map. I should update this from the Berkeley earthquake that occurred um, in January. So it's very dense coverage. That's the point I want to make with this. Very dense coverage. Um, for those of you who are thinking, well, how good is the data? Here's a record section from that same Borrego Springs earthquake. You can see that we can see P waves out at about 200 kilometers. We can see S waves. You want to look a little closer? Here's a comparison of a smartphone record. This is now closer to the epicenter. I forget the distance, 40 kilometers from the epicenter. And what we're overlaying here is a smartphone that was closest to a traditional seismic sensor. So you can really see the comparison. So we wouldn't expect the waveforms to be identical, but we would expect them to be similar and you can see that's exactly what we're seeing so this is actually usable data that's my point here the smartphones are recording usable data for a whole range of research activities and then the final piece of course bringing it to what's perhaps of most interest to this group is the idea of using it to to monitor buildings we can thank monica who's also on the panel at, from caltech um, for getting us started on this with some tests that we did in the Millikan Library, and um, where we started to sort of see what we could record on the smartphones. Um, what you can see here is we can easily um, determine the modal frequency of the buildings. So that's a starting point, but we're just really getting started in terms of determining what we can extract from this data in terms of building response. Um, but the concept is obvious. The concept is that you could use this to start um, monitoring the structural health of buildings. We have a, a huge database already at this point. So while I told you that phones um, trigger, they're accurate 93% of the time, we, on average, each phone that's running MyShake triggers four times per day and then uploads five minutes of data. So even when there aren't earthquakes, we end up with this incredible data set um, that one minute before the trigger, before the person picked up the phone, actually provides us with information. And we're starting to explore how we can mine that data to tell us about the environment, um, the, the built environment that these phones are in. So we're just getting started, um, but I think that there's a lot of potential, um, and that's why I wanted to share it with this group. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, is it just go through? The, did I do something wrong? Yes, I did. Yours is supposed to be next? Yes, I think so. Yes. At least according to the list here. Let's see if the slides okay. are there. Is it, are these yours? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, so maybe it's yours. No, those are Richard's. Those oh. are Richard's? Okay, Richard, let me just... Oh, that is not mine. That's not yours either? Is that yours? Yeah. That's mine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then I'm happy to introduce uh, Biondo Biondi from Stanford University. Thank you. Thank you, Janelle, and thanks, everybody. Um, 
very glad to be here because this is not a community that I interact very often. I'm a seismologist like Richard, but even farther removed from you, I typically use seismic data to image uh, the subsurface, collecting very large data set with the goal of understanding better the geology and the subsurface. So I'm not even an earthquake seismologist. However, I think that I have something interesting for you and uh, uh, I do appreciate the work of the community because I am a California homeowner. I do have a CAA uh, policy and uh, about 18 years old, I, uh, eight years uh, ago, I did buy a 1924 home and I bought uh, uh, without looking underneath and immediately when I did call an engineer to uh, inspect it, I regretted it. And that gave me the motivation of uh, building a new home five years ago, and I will tell you that actually has a lot to do with this project. So what is the project? The project is to build a billion sensor array, hopefully under uh, earthquake active areas like uh, the Bay Area. Now, you may think that billion sensors is literally hyperbolic and uh, little too many. I will say that actually those billion sensors are right in place today. So I don't need to do really any logistics to deploy those sensors. Now, if uh, it is economical and feasible to uh, tap into those sensors today, this is a different story and I would say no. However, I want to work towards that direction. And uh, what do I want to do with that billion sensor array and the Bay Area? First, I would like to understand better the geology of the Bay Area and the mechanisms that uh, create earthquakes under the Bay Area. So that is somewhat a little farther away from your interest, but I think it's clearly important for anybody that is interested in earthquake hazards in California. The uh, one that I think is a little closer to you, and uh, as uh, I will discuss, and I start working on that, with uh, two colleagues at Stanford that are closer to your community. One was mentioned actually today, that is Jack Baker in civil engineering, and another one that is Greg Berosa, that is in geophysics like me, but he is actually an earthquake seismologist, is to use uh, of the, uh, this sensor array for two main purposes that are relevant to your work. One is for geotechnical studies of very high resolution studies of the subsurface, and another one for uh, looking at short and long range correlation in ground motion, or uh, using both earthquakes and uh, natural noise uh, going around the Earth. So what is the idea is to use fiber uh, cables that have been deployed for telecom uh, by the telecom industry to uh, collect seismic data. Uh, this uh, beautiful picture uh, that was actually created by Stam and that is a graphic uh, a company in the city for a display at the Victoria and Albert Museums in London is uh, data, is a display of data that we have been recording for the past one year and a half on the Stanford campus. So we do have a two and a half kilometers array for 610 sensors uh, that have been running continuously on the Stanford campus since uh, basically September of 2016 and collecting data all the time. And uh, this is a prototype of what we could do and uh, uh, why can I think that this can be scaled? Because the basic cost of sensors, and I'm sorry for a little mess up of the symbols there, is going from a Mac to a Windows, uh, you always have problems. And uh, the basic idea that I would like to point out is that the single sensor that uh, can be every few meters of this fiber uh, cable or uh, is only a few dollars. So we are really far away from the $10,000 uh, that uh, Janil was quoting. These sensors are not as good as broadband seismometers. However, you can have potentially millions of billions of them uh, under uh, cities. Then there is a cost of installation of the cables that hopefully will be partially paid by the telecom industry that has already the cables. And by the way, they are approximately only 30% of the fiber cables deployed by the telecom industry are active at every single time. So there are 70% of those cables that could be tapped and used for this kind of uh, experiment. 
And uh, the other one is a laser interrogator. The basic idea is that you are going on one hand of a cable, send lasers, using the natural impurity in the cable, you measure the uh, energy reflected, scatter it back, and by quite sophisticated signal processing, you can create a virtual uh, sensor every few meters along uh, that cable. And that's uh, one interrogator can interrogate about 20, 30 kilometers of fibers. In our uh, Stanford experiment is about five kilometers, but could be extended uh, further. So we are using, proposing to use cables under the ground in telecom infrastructure in existing open conduits. So to prove that actually that is collect useful data, we went ahead and used uh, the extensive telecom infrastructure under Stanford campus and tapped into that, and that is where we collect the data. And the first question, I'm not going to show you too much seismic data because probably is beyond your interest. Uh, but uh, uh, this on the right is uh, kind of a map of Stanford campus with uh, uh, the shape of our array. On the left is seismic data uh, acquired uh, uh, in conjunction with the small events uh, in Ladera, five kilometers away from Stanford. The event was about four kilometers deep, and they were 1.8 and 1.6 in magnitude. There are two events, and these are the P waves, and uh, of the first panel on the left, and the middle panel is the difference between that event and an event that happened a half an hour later. So uh, you see, this is a 1.8, this is a 1.6, and you see that basically the difference is noise, is pumped noise and traffic noise, but the main signal, the wave field, that is extremely complex, and that tells you the uh, value of uh, having such dense arrays. Those wave fields are extremely complex, bring a lot of information on the subsurface, but is totally repeatable from two different uh, events. So indeed, we can collect useful seismic data using this technology. So in the short term, something that I think that uh, might be interest to this audience, what we would like to do with this uh, uh, data is uh, uh, to uh, expand a little bit, actually, uh, our next goal is to put an array under the city of San Francisco and uh, uh, collect data there at the same time that the Stanford. So what we would like to do is to use basically seismic interferometry to, uh, to create a very high resolution and uh, hopefully high reliability maps of the geotechnic geotechnical parameters that could be used by civil engineers to uh, 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 better design uh, buildings and infrastructures. And that is not only true under the cities, but also in suburban environment where we have single uh, family homes. And going back at the beginning, where I said that this is related to my experience of a homeowner, uh, the idea of doing this came to me when and I rebuilt uh, my 1920 homes. Now I have a wonderful contemporary home built five years ago on Stanford campus. And uh, I had to talk with Google Fibers to bring uh, internet into my home through Fibers running through a PVC conduit. It's very similar to the one that uh, are all over the Bay Area in urban and suburban environment. And I said, well, like, I heard from some friends that you can use this as a seismometer. Can I actually use this as a seismometer under my home and uh, everybody's home in the Bay Area? And I think the answer is yes. And uh, so we can uh, uh, measure ge geotechnical properties, as well also having maps, of course, correlation of uh, ground motion between uh, large scale al uh, around the Bay Area that will help assess uh, the hazard seen of the Bay Area as a global entities, and uh, so helping insurers like CEA to set the right uh, insurance premium. And thanks for your attention. And I would be happy to answer any question during the panel. Thank you very much. Really ama amazing stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs> I don't know where everyone's uh, slide starts, so I'll let yeah, you. I'll let you. Was the backup slide. No worries. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Gazi Lildirim from Zeismos. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. At Sismos, we are building sensor network to mitigate earthquake hazards. But I cannot see my page. Next, okay. Okay. 
Globally, earthquakes have killed 750,000 people last two decades, and it has killed more people than any other type of disasters combined. It is the most deadly natural disaster. However, we are collecting with a, this data with a few sensors, as Richard already pointed out. Example from the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989, we had only 40 sensors in San Francisco. You think 20 years, 30 years later, we are going to have thousands of sensors, but today I count 41 sensors from the California Integrated Seismic Network webpage. Maybe it's not updated, but I doubt that we have more than 100 sensors. Problem is still continuing. You might think why we need a high-resolution high network. This is one example from the same earthquake, 1989. There are two sensors very close to each other, one mile apart. One reads the ground shaking moderate, other reads strong. Because each place responds differently for the same earthquake. This is not an extreme case, actually it's a very modest case. If you look at the multiple sensors on the same earthquake, they are about the same distance. The change is as much as 500%. This means any model, earthquake hazard models, you build on the top of these few data points, inherently is going to have this large interpolation error. This is the one big error we call side effects. And it changed as much as thousands percent. And solution is obvious. Solution is to deploy dense network, parcel by parcel, street by street network. But uncertainty doesn't stop there. There are another uncertainty research coming from the building. Type of the buildings, we have no idea. To track or to monitor this kind of, incorporated this kind of uncertainty, we have to deploy the sensor home by home. That is the final solution. And this was the vision Janel and every seismologist earthquake engineer has had for the last 40 years. It's not our vision. Everybody would like to have a sensor in the home. It was not possible because of the technology. But last 10, 15 years, especially advanced in internet cloud mobile technology, make the connected sensors feasible at a reasonable low cost. But key advance happens in the low-cost MEMS accelerometers. Over the years, last 10, 15 years, it has been cheapened to under the $5, couple of dollars, and it becomes better and better. One example we did in the shake tables, this sensor can feel the very light shaking, like tapping, very light tapping to very strong shaking, and their response rate is, uh, response rate is pretty good from 0.1 hertz to 100 hertz. For non-technical audience, this means these are good enough for structural health monitoring, even for earthquake monitoring. And we set up a small network in Northern California. We were collaborating with the catastrophic modeler, especially RMS and the Air Worldwide. Their number one question was this. You are installing a sensor in home. Is the floor, wall, what about the different walls? Are we going to have a consistent reading from the different walls? This is the most important question. If you don't have the con consistent reading, you messed up. You cannot make any conclusion. We set up the multiple buildings with the several sensors on the different walls. I'm sharing just two data, but most data agree. Two sensors on the different walls. We caught like 10, 15 earthquakes, I think, for this building and other buildings. Data is very similar. Error is about five to 10 percent. So this means it is less sensitive to location inside the house. But one case I would like to point out, we found that wall direction acceleration amplified the acceleration 10 times. It was slab wall, and it was problem with, uh, there was a, uh, artificials, because we put the sensors, it was dark, we didn't see, but wall was vibrating on the wall direction. That amplified the results. So this means it's not a corner case. As you have to be careful when you're installing sensors on the wall or the floor. You have to make sure that it is stable. And just, I have a two short story. Uh, one of the data we were sharing with the Swiss Reinsurance, uh, Urquix uh, data from the Suzy's house, I will call the Suzy's house, we were sharing the spectral acceleration parameter. This is one of the most important parameters in earthquake design. And they replied me immediately. They said, is this house on the hill or on the very steep slope? I was shocked because I did the installation. This house was on the top of the hill and just on the very steep slope. And they didn't see pictures, they don't know the location, but they immediately asked the question because they see the 
uh, bump in the spectral uh, spectra, and their intuition was exactly right. Second come from the, our hardware engineer. It was our first day we were testing our sensor. This house, we put the two sensor on the front house, on the different walls, and third sensor we put on the back of this house. And our engineer told me, Gazi, my name is Gazi by the way, we have a sensor problem on the back. It's not unstable, it shows, it's not consistent with the front, uh, sensor on the front, fronts perfectly match each other, but it looks like house of the back is unstable. It's not possible. And I go replace the sensors, put more secure, better location, come back, we look at the data, it's the still same. We go replace the sensor, maybe thought the sensor is faulty, it's still same. We, start, we decide to use another sensor, maybe we thought the sensor is faulty. Finally, when I do this lot of change, house owner Anna told me, why do you keep changing the, this specific sensor? I said, this part of the house is shaking more because it's not consistent. And she said she knows this, she knows why it's happening. I said, why, why? Because her husband, she says, built this house. It was the two part. Actually, this is not a single part. First part is built separately. Big and big house has been separated, has been built years later. And when he was building, he was at, he was entertaining his kids to uh, move the house shake the house. So he said it was always uh, unstable on the back end house. And I come back and told my engineer, house is, sensor is okay, house has a two piece. So uh, I like to make the analogy of the sensor data to baby cry. If you are a parent, baby cries, when you have the first time baby cries, you baby cannot tell what baby, what she needs, food, diaper change, or she, she is sick. So as a parent, you have to figure out why, what she needs. And but as a parent, you know that she needs attention. Our observation from the field, observe, uh, field data shows that sensor definitely tell a story. But it doesn't tell the story. You have to figure out, as an engineer or scientist, we have to figure out what is the story. My opinion, this can be only solved if you can deploy, maybe if you can do the large dense demo field, maybe several thousand, maybe 5,000 sensors to identify specific problem from the sensor data. But definitely it shows anomaly. Sensor data shows anomaly in the buildings. That is the end of my talk. Thank you so much. So as you can see, the diversity, but the amazing things that are going on. Our next speaker is Monica Kohler from Caltech. Can you hear me all right? All right, great. Yeah, I want to talk uh, about a project taking place at Caltech called the Community Seismic Network. And uh, if there's one message that uh, I think you should be walking away from uh, after this panel o is over, and that is that we need many more sensors out there to uh, observe all of these uh, types of data that are needed to do not just uh, post-event, post-earthquake response, but also to do pre-event uh, system behavior. And so that's what I'm going to touch on right now. All right, so uh, uh, we know from regional seismic networks that we can uh, look at products like ShakeMap after an earthquake has occurred. Uh, but even in regions like Los Angeles and San Francisco, the regional seismic networks are not nearly dense enough to give us the kind of information at the spatial scale that we can use in order to do post-event or pre-event uh, system behavior. And so uh, to get around the issue of how do we get more sensors, that is more accelerometers or uh, seismometers in general in the field, and not just the free field, but in, 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 in uh, uh, structures uh, at the spatial scale that we desire, how do we do that at a way, in a way that's cost effective such that we can get thousands or tens of thousands of more sensors in the field? And so at Caltech, we've come up with uh, our solution to that, which is the, the Community Seismic Network, which takes advantage of MEMS sensor technology, which I think has already been alluded to, uh, and packages that together with a little computer such that you can just simply plug in this computer sensor package. Uh, anywhere you want to begin recording vibrations. And so we've done that in the greater Los Angeles area, both in the free field, uh, which means typically first floor or, or basement levels of structures, as well as upper floor in, in buildings, both mid-rise and high-rise structures. 
We also send our data to the cloud, a cloud archive, which gets us, gets us around getting all the data back to some central uh, collection and processing site that's in the middle of the hazard itself. And by doing that, we're able to set up uh, subsets of sensors that can do customized uh, data products that would be of interest to building owners or homeowners or, or companies or some subset of, of our community that may be interested in looking at what their, their system or, or their uh, campus or community, uh, how it responds to earthquakes. All right, so this is what a basic uh, community seismic sensor uh, uh, network sensor looks like. It's basically a little accel accelerometer, which in itself is about $25, and I even, I even brought one of the little toys with me. This, this is commercial off-the-shelf technology, uh, which is what makes it inexpensive, but uh, uh, sensitive enough to do what we need to do with the sensor. Uh, and this is a typical sensor of what you find in, say, Wii uh, video gaming, if you play Wii games with your kids or your grandkids, or in and for example, um, uh, airbag technology in your car. And we couple that with the computer, which just run, runs a Linux computing system uh, together with internet connection and a battery backup. So we have these uh, deployed around the greater LA area, including in many of our houses. In fact, I have one in my house that's continuously recording vibrations 24-7. Uh, so we have about 1,000 of these units deployed in the greater Los Angeles area at a much greater scale than typical seismic uh, uh, networks that we're used to. And we have also deployed them in, uh, uh, on every floor of several buildings in the greater LA area, including a building on the Caltech campus, a, a building, couple buildings in downtown Los Angeles, building at USC, and several buildings at the NASA JPL campus in Northwest Pasadena. And so I wanna show you some of the kind of information that we can get from the continuous recording from these very dense networks. Uh, but before I do that, I want to show you why, what, you know, what, what it is that we can gain from these dense uh, networks. Uh, we're, most of you are probably used to looking at maps of things like VS30 uh, or uh, seismic velocities in the, in the geotechnical layers. In fact, many of those maps are very smooth and they're very long wavelength. So they're only approximations uh, as to what's really going on in, that, in those upper layers that we're concerned with with respect to structural response. So when we put dense sensors into, or dense networks into the field, we're able to get much higher spatial sampling of things like seismic velocities uh, in the uppermost few uh, hundreds of meters uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the crust. So this just shows an example of what a VS30 map might look like in the upper right, very smooth, not much information in the uh, northern LA area. But if we look at what uh, a dense network can give us, like the community seismic network, we get much higher uh, uh, variation, larger uh, variations over a smaller spatial scale because of the, the scale and the, and the density of the, of the sensors in the field. So the two earthquakes at the bottom show you the kind of information you get almost on a block by block level of sensing uh, when you have uh, sensors like this. All right, so this, for example, uh, is, is uh, I'm gonna show you what, what the kind of uh, response that you can see in the field when you go from one uh, ge geological province to another geological province. And uh, so if I can, uh, let's see if I can, Okay, so this is a, an animation showing the response of the ground on community seismic network sensors during the 2016 Borrego Springs earthquake. Not much is happening yet. This is just kind of the background noise or the noise of the sensors themselves. But pretty soon, you can see in the upper right-hand side of this little movie, the ground is starting to shake uh, greater because of the incoming waves from that earthquake. This is just from these $300 sensors that are mostly in people's houses. And what you can see here in the lower left where the, the, the dots are really lighting up quite a lot in the oranges and the yellow is the basin response. So as, as homeowners, uh, this is critical information uh, that allows you to understand what your shaking may be, uh, may be if you live over, for example, a deep sedimentary basin, which is what the Northern Los Angeles Basin is a deep sedimentary basin that is abutting the foothills uh, at the northern part of that LA basin. So many of you are probably aware of ShakeMap. ShakeMap is a great, you know, it's a great useful post-event response tool, but it's very, it's still very smooth and, and very long wavelength. And as a, as a result, 
uh, on small spatial scales, it's still kind of approximate, even in, L in, in the LA and the San Francisco area where we have these, these regional networks. Uh, and on top of that, if you're familiar with the, shake, the US Geological Shakecast uh, product, which allows you to determine fragilities uh, of your structures, whether they're homes or businesses or high rises, the shake cast tool that calculates the fragilities for your structure still uses shake map as, it, as its input. So an approximate fragility is also dependent on an approximate input from smooth shake map. So we're in the process of inputting uh, data from our dense community seismic network networks, uh, sensors, into a prototype shake map that gives you the intensity of shaking on a much smaller spatial scale and therefore useful on a block by block or even building by building um, scale. Uh, and so therefore, you would be able to get a lot better uh, input into your shake cast est estimates for building fragilities. So let me come back to the buildings. Uh, so we have uh, these several buildings in the greater LA area instrumented on at least one triaxial accelerometer per floor. And in many cases, we have more than one. We have two or even three triaxial accelerometers per floor. So what does this give us? So this, for example, is a building on the JPL campus where we have actually three accelerometers on every floor. And so I just want to show you just very briefly the kind of uh, response you can get uh, in, uh, in buildings where you have this continuous data. So this, just for example, shows a normalized shear strain measurement from all of the measurements coming out of that building during that same Borrego Springs earthquake that I showed before. And you can imagine, you know, shear strain is, is just one particular type of measurement. You can imagine many other types of measurements that you can now show on a very small spatial scale, even within buildings that are not dependent on, say, for example, an approximate input at the base of the building. You can imagine that, for example, if you had uh, several sensors in a home or an apartment building, you would be able to get now very uh, dense measurements of how the building shook uh, during earthquakes uh, in order to identify where damage may have occurred and perhaps even in the at the element scale where damage may have occurred in order to go back and and do uh, uh, retrofitting or, or damage mitigation. So uh, let me just wrap up by showing, uh, just kind of concluding where I think we're, there, there's really a lot of promise for what we can do with dense networks inside buildings. And I'll show this high rise just as an example, but I think we can imagine how this is extensible to apartment buildings or you know, multi-story houses. Um, obviously we wanna understand the structural performance on a very small scale, at least floor by floor, if not smaller than that. Uh, and so for example, in this high rise building where we have one sensor on every floor, you see on the right-hand side, we recorded accelerations uh, during the 2015 Castaic Lake earthquake. And so in real time, we can calculate things like interstory drift. And if on top of that, we have uh, structural drawings from buildings that we're interested in, in instrumenting and, and conducting structural health monitoring in, we can combine our observations in real time with dynamic analysis of those, uh, of those finite element models that we uh, calculate for the buildings in order to conduct um, uh, stress measurements in, and, and that is in turn to determine whether yielding has occurred beyond, uh, beyond, the, beyond the design limits of structures and then ultimately ultimately to do damage detection and uh, damage mitigation. All right, so I'm gonna wrap it up by saying thank you and acknowledging the Community Seismic Network team at Caltech. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, Andy Thompson from SafeHub. Thanks, Monica. <clears throat> Good morning. I guess both are working. My name is Andy Thompson, uh, CEO and co-founder of SAFA, where, where we provide uh, real-time, site-specific risk information about buildings for homeowners and for the financial industry. Uh, we view risk as really something that's dynamic. It's a daily thing. It's not a, uh, every time you get a risk assessment every year, it's, it, it's something that changes, um, especially after, uh, after damaging events. And so we're measuring it in real time. How we're doing that is um, monitoring with um, affordable compact uh, sensors, measuring ambient vibrations, some of, the, some of the techniques that have been shown today, 
um, small and large earthquakes, analyzing, analyzing that data um, based upon um, really analysis performed on the device, sending that information up to the cloud, and then communicating that information through dashboard analysis, et cetera. Um, in terms of damage detection, damage detection and alerts, um, really providing that initial understanding of loss based upon shaking at the site, um, comparing the resonant frequencies pre and post in terms of understanding what, uh, what some of the changes are to dynamics, measuring the inner story drift, again, and providing that remote real-time alert and reporting and supporting, importantly, on-ground engineering damage assessments. I spent um, much time in my previous life, my previous career at Arup, uh, doing engineering damage assessments uh, following earthquakes, and it's really challenging actually doing these damage assessments, as many people in the audience um, uh, know, without having tangible um, data to be able to rely upon. And having some of this sensor data would have been extremely valuable in those, um, in those situations. And also real-time uh, real risk information for individual homes and buildings. Um, again, relying upon ambient vibration from wind and traffic, et cetera, small and large earthquakes. Um, and then combining that with uh, both, both our understanding of risk, but also um, some of the modeling um, methodologies out there, both from a portfolio and site-specific um, um, method, methods. And that's information that can improve over time, of course. Um, we're really just getting started. We have 25 prototypes in the field. Um, I had it. Thank you. This is this is our this is our current pro prototype here in terms of measuring uh, measuring the the information and 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 getting it to the cloud. Um, we're working with several commercial um, partners in terms of. Getting, the, getting these devices um, out into the field. The bottom right image is one of those, uh, one of those in installation. Um, and we, um, we're just getting started and we're, we're, we're growing extremely, um, extremely rapidly. Um, we're on our third version of the prototype and uh, we have all of our cloud infrastructure, website, dashboard, et cetera. Um, and we can go into that on a one-on-one -on -one basis if, uh, if people want to see sort of the dashboard that we're developing, et cetera. So a, a, a quick overview of Safe Hub, Safe Hub and uh, look forward to, uh, to chatting with you um, during the next couple of days. Thank you. So we do have a, another speaker, uh, Yusef called me. I had no idea that this um, project that he's working on even existed. So it's very, very interesting. So Yusuf Borzonia from Peer. Thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, okay, it works. So I think I'm the first engineer on the face of the earth that I'm not going to show you slides. <laughs> and so I have two disclaimers also. Uh, first of all, as you know, we have a large project uh, with CA on Cripple Wall. What I'm talking about, it has nothing to do with with that project. In fact, it has nothing to do with peer. Um, secondly, I'm only one small member of a very large team. Many people are involved, multiple universities and multiple large and small companies are involved. I, I'm just reporting you uh, something that few years ago uh, we were uh, dreaming about. It became from dream really goal and now it's about uh, to happen. So this is the story. Uh, all of our homes, as you know, we have gas meter and we have electricity meters and as you remember up to just few years ago a fellow used to come from the utility writing the uh, meter going back and send us the bill so that has been changed we still get the bills uh, don't worry about that part <laughs> but that fellow is not jobless. And the reason is that the meters are becoming smart meters and they send the signals it's, uh, wirelessly to utilities and then utilities, they send you the bill. Uh, so a few years ago, uh, there was a, a brainstorming that what about we, uh, we design uh, very cheap, uh, I mean in terms of uh, cost and very small accelerometer put it inside the smart meters to send wirelessly during the earthquake the signals. So that was originally brainstorming, but with the brave uh, uh, researchers and the influential people in our community, large and small companies. So the 
chip has been designed, the accelerometer has been designed, not by me, by, by electrical engineers and so on. Uh, it was lots of back and forth op optimization about the cost. Obviously, cost is very important. So the concept is to put it inside the meter and send it uh, wirelessly. So prototype has been designed. That part is done, again, not by me, by very uh, um, competent electrical engineers in interactions with earthquake engineers. So the concept, if it happens, which is happening at the lowest uh, pace now, but hopefully a, lo a larger speed in the next few years. In the next 10 years, possibly we are gonna have in California three to five million sensors at every single homes, and wirelessly they will send the acceleration motions uh, uh, through uh, cloud and lots of other details that they still have to be uh, done. So as uh, others mentioned, as you know, the state of California right now, they, we have the public version, we have about 1,100 or 1,500 instruments. Yeah. It may become literally three to five million. The advantage of this obviously is that we are going to know exactly what's going on at every single homes or most of uh, single homes during the earthquake. And the amount of data is enormous. So suppose we get a magnitude seven plus minus 10 second recording, 100 hertz uh, sampling rate, three components, and one million home triggers. We are literally getting three billion data points. So uh, when I was talking to a faculty member in computer science, because they talk about big data and so on, when they talk about big data, it means tens of millions or hundreds of millions, not tens of billions of the data. So uh, we, I'm on the end user of this concept. We are putting together a team of obviously earthquake engineers, seismologists, electrical engineers, and computer science uh, scientists to have a design, a prototype hardware and software to read tremendous amount of data. Obviously, we don't have all of them. So there are maybe 50 homes already instrumented like that, but uh, it may become exponentially into millions of homes and design it have very efficient algorithm to co compute the intensity measures, various intensity measures and engineering demand parameters and pass it somehow to public. So the part that I'm involved is at the end uh, uh, user phase of these things, but we have to think about it. For CE and insurance industry, I think this is tremendous amount of opportunity. Basically, you're gonna know every single home what's going on. There are some challenges also. Uh, as you, uh, you can uh, imagine, there, these uh, meter, uh, meters are not on the ground and they're not on the roof. So in fact, there are some regulations that it has to be at a specific height from the ground because the person who used to come not to uh, bend too much and of it, if it was short person, not to uh, be able to read it and so on. So there are not ground motion, they are not roof response, but we are thinking to do simulations to give, get it uh, to the ground, uh, how much is amplification and re uh, get to ground motion and then possibly uh, how much is gonna be a strong uh, motion and response of the building. The other challenge is that there are some legal uh, challenges that we are thinking we're talking to legal schools also. Suppose I don't want you to know what's going on in my house uh, in terms of motions. So in terms of reading millions of the data we have to aggregate them just to make sure if someone doesn't want uh, uh, to be released their motions, we take care of that. There are other challenges that others have it also among say million uh, instruments triggering magnitude seven or six uh, earthquake, there will be, I'm pretty sure, thousands of them malfunction. So we have to have uh, algorithms to screen the uh, uh, malfunction instruments during the real uh, times, which are, those are solvable. But uh, what I want to share with you that 
it's very likely if it will happen, at least there is no uh, uh, financial opposition as we speak, because it costs a lot for uh, utilities to install uh, these things. And if it happens, literally, it's going to be a great asset for everyone, obviously, for seismologists, ground motion uh, analysts, uh, structural engineers, and I think for earthquake insurance, that we may have to think about it. Do we have to send, again, adjusters to every single home and so on? or we take advantage of this uh, wirelessly transmitted data. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, as you can see, uh, the variety and the uh, amazing amount of data that we could collect from these is, is really fascinating. Um, I, what came to mind is, a, was it a chicken in every pot, a car in every garage, and a sensor on every wall? I mean, it really is cost effective now. Pardon me? Put them on the floor. On the floor, at the ceiling, and at the roof, <laughs> and free field. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start with a, a couple of questions because I, when I go out and I speak, every single time I go to a group of homeowners, they ask me about um, gas shutoff valves. And, and I, I tell them that the CEA has no official p position, but that um, it is my understanding that you are not to turn your gas back on again once you turn it off. And you have to wait until the utility comes back out and d does it. So that if we had gas shutoff valves in every house, it could literally take months to get everybody back up and running. Has there, have there been any discussions about these kind of interacting with gas, sh gas shutoff, or are they separate, a separate thought? It, it, it's uh, separate, but I know, I don't know what happened. To, oh, OK. Uh, it's a little bit separate, but uh, because of the reasons that you mentioned, uh, the utilities decided to put these smart meters in the electricity meter rather than gas okay. meter. Got it. So the concept of these accelerometers, small, very small, very cheap accelerometer, they'll go inside of the electricity smart uh, meter. Gas shot of valve, you're absolutely correct, at, as part of AC, Tickly that I've been involved, uh, Andre has been involved, and so on. The performance of gas shot of valves in earthquakes uh, is mixed because there are different varieties and so on, but it's not part of what I was talking. Great. Um, yeah, so I, I always tell them that it'd be nice to have a smart meter that turned off, pardon me, a smart valve that turned off your gas if it sensed, you know, a pressure differential, you know, or something that indicated a leak. Um, but I know that it's becoming mandatory in some communities. Um, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then I want to open it up and really encourage dialogue and wait until you have a microphone. Um, so, Richard, this, this phones, I understand they're not yet iPhones? It's not yet on the iPhone? That's our number one complaint. Where's the iPhone version? It's only available on the Android. I didn't say it's only available for Android right now. It is free app. So if you have an Android phone, you should go to the Google Play Store and download MyShake. But the iPhone version is coming. Um, um, it'll be coming later this year. Great. And then um, I want to ask this of, of um, both Ghazi and um, of uh, Andy. The, the, the little things that you just plug in on the, the walls have the, the opportunity to, I think, as you mentioned, Andy, to, to alert the homeowner of, of other things that are going on in the house. And so um, is that kind of the way that you think that you'll be able to get these into homes? Well, I'm <clears throat> The um, the great challenge is getting it into homes, um, and um, earthquakes apparently don't happen don't happen in California anymore. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> joke. little ones. Um, but um, no. But if you look at uh, you know the, the last last major earthquake being 1994. Um, and if it's the sort of information that is valuable every 20 to 30 years, it doesn't really leave a big incentive for the homeowner to put it into their home. Um, and so what information can you provide the homeowner other than just an alert that says that um, um, your home is uh, you know, damaged or not um, 20 to 30 years later is, um, is 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 the key, and so linking it with insurance transaction, um, linking it with other aspects of um, um, measuring other things that happening are in the house um, are are important. Are important. For me, I was talking to a professor at University of California, and he told me problem 
is to install the sensors in the homes. If you look at the uh, Los Angeles area, there is a law. They have to install sensors in the high building, I think, Monica. And he says, surprisingly, mysteriously, all sensors, most of the sensors are broken. Mm -hmm. so, so he told me, really, homeowner resisted this information. If you look at the radon gas, it's a different subject. They don't report the specific radon gas reports. Nobody wants to report their house report. There is a law they somehow report at the zip level, zip level code. The main problem, homeowner, building owner thinks, what is in for me? That's a big, big problem. We thought that uh, we initially started as an earthquake early warning system. We thought that you are going to get earthquake early warning. Maybe that is the one incentive. But I strongly believe that real incentive is monetary incentive, like coming from the insurance company or the CA. Give them a, some discount. If you have this sensor, you are going to get the discounts. It's a very quantitative number. And then in return, we will get the data. And we will never use this data against you. We have to somehow make sure that this data will never be used against them. So uh, we had a, a serious problem. I think that's a most difficult problem than the technical problem, in my opinion. How do you put the million sensors or the thousand, hundred thousand sensors in the people home? Right. For them, it's easy. But for when you scale, you are going to have this kind of problem. <laughs> So, uh, Monica and, and uh, Biondo, do you have plans or, or kind of how, how you can increase the, the kind of uptake, we'll call it, on, on your, your devices? I know in our case, uh, we haven't focused so much on single family homes. Uh, we are focusing more on businesses, business owned uh, mid rise structures and high rise structures because they're all the same kinds of issues. And so, there, what we are focusing on is trying to produce the kinds of products, both pre earthquake and post you know, event products, that those uh, building owners and managers will find useful. And once they find them useful, and in fact, we're lucky and we've been very lucky to work with one large uh, high rise building owner who is very proactive. In in terms of wanting to understand how buildings have responded to shaking, strong shaking, because uh, they have sensors in the buildings for things like floods or you know controlling where the elevators are or controlling uh, HVAC uh, types of, of uh, mechanics. And so they also want to understand what the vibrations of the buildings look like. And so I think that if we can uh, produce the kind of products that are useful to homeowners, building owners, this may uh, provide a motivation for getting more sensors in the buildings. And you know, hopefully we can get one building owner to say, you know, look at all these cool things we have in our building. Look at all the stuff we can look at in, look at in real time and look at uh, the kind of response we can do immediately without waiting for anybody else to tell us what to do. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you like to have these in your building too? Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're hoping that that's kind of a, a motivation to get more sensors in more buildings. Maybe as part of these, I know that uh, San Francisco has it. LA is looking into um, having a, a structural engineer kind of assigned to a building so they can respond immediately after an event. This would be very useful information. It would be. What uh, we are proposing that is quite different to what uh, I heard is that it doesn't need any permission from homeowners. So those cables are there uh, and they are really managed by telecom utilities. And uh, so the, our biggest challenge is uh, totally to convince the telecom utilities to land at least for research purposes their cable to, uh, to us. And that's one of the reasons why I came here because I think that some in the audience may have the reach to help us connection with the telecom and so on. I've been networking with both telecoms as well equipment makers because eventually what uh, uh, in the future, uh, the technology that we are talking about would be integrated with uh, conventional telecom, telecommunication, uh, fiber optics, laser equipment, and uh, that becomes just one big service in which this added, uh, the kind of the uh, earthquake part uh, adds values to the existing infrastructure. So there is a, a potential economical benefits there for the operators. Uh, of course, they may be reluctant to to uh, get us in their operations. So the next step for us is to uh, go beyond uh, uh, the very much prototype that we experiment that we have going on at Stanford that will go on uh, still probably for a few years. And we are collecting a lot of information that has to do also with 
time lapse. So one thing that is wonderful of this uh, uh, continuous recording is that you see how soil condition change with season or potentially if an earthquake has happened in the area uh, that actually has changed uh, the soil response in, in the area and potentially react to that. So that's uh, w what I'm saying is that next step is to have a larger network, uh, uh, sensor networks, and we need really to talk with uh, some of the telecom companies and getting their agreement and cooperation. Pretty amazing stuff. I'd like to open it up, and as I do, I want to, I specifically asked the group not to, to focus on earthquake early warning, um, but certainly you can see the application for earthquake early warning is, is, is huge here, and um, I want to acknowledge that great opportunity to, to not only to contribute to the input, but of course to have uh, sensors and well, let's just say communication devices available to, to relay the message once we figure out what that message should be. Um, so I would like to open it up, raise your hand and we'll, we'll get you a microphone and um, nobody. Yes, oh, okay, okay. Oh sorry, you go. John? I guess I'll ask a question. I have a question for Richard. First, a comment. Congratulations on being the first software developer to do Android instead of iPhone first. <laughs> I don't see a problem with that. You know, if you're an Android user, you're in the minority in this room. <laughs> then why did you start there? So let me answer that question. It's actually important. <laughs> so the, there's far, far more Android phones in the world than there are iPhones. Um, and so that's why we started with Android. They're completely separate platforms. Um, in the US, it's basically 50-50. In California, there's more iPhones. In Berkeley, it's less than 5% that have iPhones. All the things you learn through the process of this. <laughs> Very interesting. So my question, I certainly understand the replacement of quality with quantity, but how do you get over the technical hurdle of all of the conditions or places that phone could be placed from being in someone's hand to sliding across the table when you're trying to get all this data? Yeah, no, that obviously is the critical thing. This is very noisy data and it's all about how you filter out the, the good data from the bad data. So first of all, the, the, the piece that I showed you is the, the piece where we can separate when a phone is starting to shake because of an earthquake from versus from somebody picking it up or doing something else. So I think that piece we have um, a system in place that, that works pretty effectively. And of course, once you see multiple phones triggering in, in one region, it's very easy to confirm that there is an earthquake and that comes to the earthquake early warning piece. That's obviously a big part of that project as well. Um, but the piece that you're still left with is when, so let's say you have a, a perfect recording in the sense that no humans touching the phone during the course of an earthquake, you still have to deal with the fact that these phones can be many different types of locations within a building. Um, and that is indeed a piece that we, we are working our way through. We don't fully understand it. Um, we, a, a couple of comments though. What we can see from our data very clearly from earthquakes is that when the shaking intensity that you see on the phones is typically larger than what you get from the regional networks. We were quite concerned about that. But now we understand that actually the, the factor of the difference that we see when you're looking in sort of broad average kind of way is in fact what engineers would expect in terms of the buildings shaking more strongly than a free surface site. So that actually gives us some confidence that we're really extracting real information about the amplitude of shaking in buildings in that you know in a sort of broad kind of average way um, and we're now starting to work we actually realize we need to collaborate with our uh, seismic engineers uh, colleagues sat next to me here um, in order to understand these kinds of processes and figure out how to extract just more information from the data so we're just getting started with that piece Janil I have a question I'm here oh, <laughs> <laughs> one issue that we are um, uh, brainstorming and uh, struggling is that public availability of all these data. Mm -hmm. uh, so, we sh uh, for example, for Richard and others, you, if you collect it, can you make it available? Or, sorry to say, public, uh, private universities, uh, can you share it with the others and so on? And we are pushing that the data should not should be totally publicly available. Otherwise, we, we cannot use it as a researcher or uh, uh, end user. So, is anybody at the table 
<laughs> it's just out and out private? So yeah, that uh, that's been a big uh, issue that we've had to address, and we usually have to address it on a customer by customer basis. And so, usually with our instrumented buildings or our, our the homes that we have instrumented, we have agreements, usually MOUs, with the different uh, sets of, of communities. And sometimes the community will say, "Sure, anybody can have any of the data that, that, that they want." Uh, usually, the, the the homeowners who are who tend to be part of the project are, are the people who say that. Um, we also have many sensors at the Los Angeles Unified School District campuses, and that those data are also publicly available uh, to anybody who, who wants all of those data. For the mid-rise and high-rise structures, there it gets a little more restricted. And so some of those um, communities say, uh, nobody can have any of the data except for you, you know, the community seismic network group. And in fact, when you publish on it, you can't even say where they came from. You can't give an address. So we have to be very careful when we publish on those data. But then there are other uh, high-rise and mid-rise building owners who say, well, anytime there's an event, you can uh, make available all the event data, the earthquake data, but you can't make available the ambient vibration data. So unfortunately, up till now, it's really more of a community-by-community agreement-based um, uh, data access issue. Can I just add quickly? So um, for my shake, uh, first of all, on the, the buildings, the, thing, the, the person who owns the data, of course, is the cell phone owner, not the building owner. And that's actually a very valuable difference um, between when you then want, because it means that you can, all you need is the cell phone owner to carry the sensor into a building. You don't need the building owner's permission. But you do then need the permission of the person whose cell phone it is. So we have a privacy policy that, um, I'm an academic, I didn't think this was a big deal until we started doing this, and it's a really big deal. Um, and so we have a privacy policy which at the moment does restrict the data to, there's a whole bunch of layers that I won't go through, but the bottom line is that right now the data is restricted to project participants. And so we haven't dealt with the, the idea of how we would share it more broadly for research. That's our intent. All of the data we generate at the Berkeley Seismic Lab is open public data, and so our intent is to figure out how we can continue to facilitate a variety of research using this data, but we have to be honest, we haven't quite figured out that piece yet. Our data is totally public domain. That's his advantage of having collected it with unrestricted money. And so it's totally my control. And I uh, will be happy to share with anybody that is interested to get that data. And uh, also we are sharing with a hackathon that is happening at Stanford in conjunction with Earth Week in April. And uh, if you know yourself or, or younger people that might be interested to participate, you can come and play around with that data in that uh, in that, that event and for me we have the data points we are sharing with the private companies under the assuming that it's not going to be public because we are collecting from the directly from the private homes I think it's going to be have a lot of problem if we share it publicly but anybody wants to talk to us see the data we are happy to share we already share the data with the RMS with the civil reinsurance right. but make sure that data is private uh, yes, I, I'd like to uh, bring a point, I think it was raised a little bit by Monica in terms of instrumenting inside building. So I see it's very important, obviously, instrumenting the ground so we get a better idea of our input. A very important instrumenting the response of buildings to so get a better uh, idea of, of, you know, our models of, of building response and so on. But if we really want to have, you know, models of loss estimation, and we heard that this morning, the first panel, the, the, the P58 process and so on, we also have to look what's going on inside the building. And the, the highest investment in building is not the structures. In most buildings, is the non-structural elements, the, you know, the, the, the components, the equipments, and so on. So it's, it's a general question to the panel. Do you see any future of implemented implementing uh, uh, instrumentation of non-structural elements. So for example, uh, flood damage due to breaking of a piping system. What I'd like to know, for example, is at what acceleration level that piping will trigger, say, leakage, which you know, induce large damage into the building. Any thoughts of that of in terms of instrumenting not the ground, not the structure, but the non-structural elements inside the building? So Andre, one quick. Do we need to instrument thousands of millions of buildings, non-structural, or the smaller subset to understand it? Because uh, for, for the project that I was talking about, that's it. It's just a meter, and that's. But uh, uh, is it practical to instrument 
thousands or millions of non-structural inside the homes, or maybe a subset randomly selected then classifications a research. I mean, either way, we use the information that we have now is essentially zero. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Yeah, let me address that because it's it's not something we've focused on, and we haven't focused on uh, instrumenting any systems besides the the primary elements in structures. Um, but in theory, you know, vibration sensors could record vibrations from all of these other sources, and so you know, either you approach it from a brute force method and say, "Okay, I'm going to instrument everything that I'm interest, interested in monitoring," or perhaps there are indirect methods for doing this sort of analysis. And I can imagine that in the future, when we have enough instruments in a, in a in a structure, we could perhaps using use machine learning methods so that you know we identify maybe a big training set of data that have all of these different signatures in the training set, and then use that training set and machine learning methods to then identify other sorts of secondary or non-structural element damage that may have occurred in the structures using all the same types of sensors. But can I go? Uh, sorry. No, go, go, go. Uh, there are already some solutions. If you look at the gas camp companies. These gas companies provide the accelerometers for the gas walls, and there is, a, I think, little actuator. When some shaking happens, it automatically shuts off. There are already solutions, exit solutions used around the world. Yes. I think Andre, I have a solution for you also. Put a smart uh, uh, cell phone inside the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> he can't read it. What, what about the big earthquakes and the fragility of the cellular networks, the fiber networks, the electrical systems? If you're relying on the cloud to collect and disseminate and process the data and, and make uh, decisions and other things like that, and those networks go down, how do your systems function? Do you buffer and hold on to the data and send it later, or what do you do? Yes and yes. <laughs> redundancy, you have to have redundancy built into it. And, and yeah, I mean, you have to, it, the more types of telemetry you have built into your system, the better, the more robust the system is. I didn't go to an, into a whole lot of detail in something that we've set up, but in addition to sending data to the cloud, we also have data sent to other servers, you know, on campus, in addition to servers that are inside uh, each of the buildings that we've instrumented. And so there are redundant paths. You ha yeah, you have to build that into the system. For our case, we are brainstorming, but I think redundancy is essential. We thought about that. So there will be different so-called clouds. One is going to be utility clouds, and then University of California clouds that they have to talk to each other. But recognize your absolute colleague. We are going to have a disruption of the internet and all the things. So we have to think carefully about at least a subset of data should be in real time. Uh, I have a different uh, angle to that. I think this is an excellent question. Uh, I think that uh, the reliability of a telecommunication infrastructure in uh, a major event is a big societal problem. I do think that uh, one ad added advantage for telecom companies collaborate to projects like ours is actually uh, estimating what is uh, their uh, uh, sensitivity or anyway, uh, but how much they can be damaged piece by piece uh, by a major event. So I do think that uh, the two things go together. So we can help them to uh, provide a more robust infrastructure and they help us to get the data that helps them to uh, build a more robust infrastructure. So I do think the two things come together, at least in the case of fiber optics. Just, John? Uh, Another question occurred to me. The conversation moved on from the privacy and ownership of data, but a question occurred to me that almost sounds like the beginning of a joke. What if a MySpace user walks into a building, one of Monica's buildings that is instrumented for a private owner, and that private owner views that data as private and was not going to let Monica release it? Uh, and the, the MyShake user has the data. Who owns the, who owns the data on the response of that building? 
What's the what's the real right answer? My shake for blocking people? apps that are going to be sold. <laughs> I, uh, obviously, that sounds like a question for a lawyer. I mean, as you heard me say. I mean, I, I and this is something that actually has had real resonance with users is that they like the idea that they can carry a sensor wherever they go. They can have a sensor in the buildings that they're working in. It's sort of empowering to the user. Um, now, whether there's some other legal aspect to this that we're unaware of yet, that, that's quite possible. These are these are challenges that society is grappling with in general, though, with smart homes and, and you know, with all the sensors in homes and how does how do we um, deal with telematics for cars and how do we deal with Alexa in our home and these sorts of things. So I think that these are important issues, but I think that they are within a broader context of smart home technology as well. That's um, that society is grappling with in general. In our case, the data is utility data. However, release of that for a specific homes, that's the part that I was mentioning. Very likely we have to aggregate the data unless we have a permission from every single home, which is very difficult. So the, the ownership will, uh, is really uh, utility, but publicly available, your the home response, I think we have to be very careful. Yeah. Actually, just my, I want to rephrase again. You have to have agreements. In return, we are going to use this data, but we are going to get something. Other than, it's almost impossible to get this data and use it. So eventually, it's like the uh, device you put in the car. You say, I'm going to give you better insurance rates, but you have to give me your data. So other than, it's very hard to convince the entire population. I want to make a comment too. Andy mentioned the, you know, the, the Alexa model, and I'm beginning to think more and more that this may be a good starting point for how we could get more sensors into homes in a way that doesn't, you know, that gets the. Privacy is a big issue, and, and homeowners are invariably not going to want you to record vibrations 24-7 in their home, and, and I can perfectly understand that and understand why. But we may be able to set up a model. I, I think we should think about how to set up a model where data are being recorded and then turned into a product that everybody finds useful, and then the data are discarded, and they're not ar archived anywhere. But the products that come out of that are products that, you know, for example, microzonation maps that would be useful, or information that goes into a shake map, or information that goes into a a better calculation of a fragility curve would then be saved because that is something that the homeowner uh, would find useful. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think a lot of home people driving around with their phone on on a, on a mapping thing realize that they're contributing to the calculation of the time it takes to get somewhere. I think a lot of people think, I don't know where they think that comes from. Um, there were questions at this, oh, you're here, okay. Hi there, I'd love to hear from different members of the panel about um, efforts to do systematic pre-event selection of buildings, properties, locations. Uh, right now it's sort of the crowdsource, you know, who is ever interested, whoever hears about it, or an engineer has a particular building, one in mind, or a city might have one in mind, but uh, that's my question. And I'm going to connect that with a couple a couple of ideas. One is just the idea of pre-event research, pre research design and how we in this audience can collaborate on that because you want the pre-event research design to move through the entire spectrum of the sciences, right? From seismologic to building design to social and behavior change and policy change. So uh, one idea that's been kicked around is when you have regulations, you obligate uh, sensor installation. So if uh, San Francisco has a soft story building law and you're making everybody do retrofits, what a great opportunity to say, select a sample of those buildings, uh, you know, instrument them and see what it changed about the building that's now been retrofit. And maybe you also select a nearby city that doesn't have laws, that has similar seismology or you know site characteristics or something, and instrument those buildings. So you get that pre-event, post-event data. You get pre-policy, post-policy data. You get one location versus another location data and maximize you know, target and that also helps you with the communication and behavior change problem of getting people to instrument. Because, uh, I mean, when you mandate, you mandate. You have a little bit of a, a leverage on people. You also have leverage when you pay an incentive. So EBB, what are we doing to instrument a systematic selection of those retrofits? Right. 
and comparative homes in those same zip codes that aren't retrofit, but are very similar in site conditions and structure. These, we are already setting ourselves up for great experiments and we need to be ready when those events happen. Um, so EBB, oh, uh, for Andy, I'm sure obviously you're thinking about smart home technologies and things like that. But one thought that came to me, again, as a new homeowner, is uh, home alarm systems. So a lot of people are very interested in video uh, for their home alarm security system. And I've wondered about the benefits of live video recordings of homes during events, particularly in terms of non-structural damage. And it's actually something I hear from homeowners. You know, I've surveyed and interviewed close to a thousand homeowners now about their perceptions about insurance and mitigation. And actually, a lot of them tell stories. This was very common in Napa um, because it has a lot of second homes. So people, they race in their car to see what has happened in their house. They want to know what's been broken. They want to know if their chimney fell down. Like, it's actually a real data craving. And also your relatives want to know. Like what, I can turn on my ADT through a My ADT app. And I want to be able to see a video of my house after the earthquake, see with whether my treasured item fell down, whether my TV fell down, whether my house fell down. Um, I think there's an interesting potential there with video. Um, and, oh, uh, on the public availability of data comment, this is a great thought. I never really pressed it in my mind, but think of the Strava crowdsourced running data breach that happened about two or three weeks ago. So Strava, somebody mined all of their worldwide running, Who's who here is familiar with, oh, this, yeah, yeah. This, with this event? So a, a CIA, you know, secret facility location was revealed because military runners circling the base had uploaded publicly to Strava, you know, where, where they had been jogging. So it became obvious where the perimeter of this uh, facility was. That's the kind of unanticipated thing. We can't think through all of the ways that um, data like this could be used. And for me, it's more about um, corporate uh, benefit and, and manipulating my private data in aggregate with others to increase profits in ways that are, you know, potentially offensive or um, bearing on that. So this is all about the systematic, the theme is the systematic pre-event targeting. I think if you do that well, you will develop better messages to incentivize people to participate because you have a very specific reason why you're asking them to participate, not counting on a broadcast message that's the same for all audiences. And we have, um, that's gonna give us the information that we need by tying it to policies and stuff to drive the economics incentive policies and the insurance discount proportions um, and where we really get the benefits. We need to validate our retrofit prescriptions um, and that will reduce skepticism about what it is we're advising people to do. Uh, so comments on, on that, I really would appreciate. Um, well, I think it would be great if the CEA mandate sensors in the area. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the 10% of homes we have insured? <laughs> or to the half a percent I have retrofit? No, I think, every home, I, I think every home in California. Dick, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> No, but I, but I think the, uh, the Earthquake Brace and Bolt program could be a low-hanging fruit in terms of, in terms of um, um, you know, these sorts of things are where you've already engaged with, with people that have an interest in earthquake um, safety, and they're probably uh, um, you know, the sort of people that would be really interested in that sort of technology, first of all, and also I think it would be, it would be a benefit, benefit to the CEO. I, I forgot about this. Because you use a lottery, you have a ready... Yeah. 
with the same economic demographic and same location yeah. to pull your match. Well, and it's now cost effective. Before, you know, it just was ridiculous. The key is how you have a relationship, uh, some sort of an agreement with a homeowner. So that, you know, you, you an ongoing agreement because they sell the home, they move, um, they, you know, somebody passes away. You have to have an ongoing agreement. Can, can, can we come to this table? Sorry. You're next, Christine. You're uh, next. Okay, with the discussion so warming up on the operational uh, security and legal, I wonder if I should dare ask a technical question. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, as a part of the CA research team, of, of obviously I'm sitting here thinking, you know, with, you know on the sensors, uh, what are the applications short-term, long-term, and even uh, low-hanging fruits for hazard characterization in California, and then for building response characterization, specifically wood frames, residentials, mainly. So uh, my question is to Dr. Biondi. Okay, uh, because you mentioned, uh, you know, you can use your tool to come up with correlations, <clears throat> uh, I guess, ground motion correlations side to side, and you mentioned I guess long periods. I mean, when a seismology says long period, I think tens of seconds. When it's an engineer says long period, I say, okay, one second, two, three, or four seconds. <laughs> but anyway, my question is, um, there are a couple of issues on correlation. One is site to site for site characterization, which is very important for on the portfolio, you know, one house, one place, one house, another. And there's another correlation, which is, period to period correlation. You know, your colleague, uh, Dr. Jack Baker, works on these two, and that's on, you know, conditional spectrum. And I was wondering, first of all, when you said, uh, you know, long period, are you talking about periods of um, up to 0.3 or 4 seconds for wood frames, or, you know, frequencies from 3 to 10 seconds? And then how far have you gone in you know, or how useful are these for both cases, site-to-site -site correlations and then, um, you know, a response spectra, you know, conditional response spectra. So let me give, first Thank give you, you uh, I may have misspoke, I meant to say longer range versus long period, but let me clarify that uh, the frequency response of the sensor is very broad. So go from a fraction of a hertz to the hundreds of kilohertz. So you really have very much a broadband uh, measurement and depends uh, the signal that you want to measure it will not make sense for earthquake to, to, to waste the effort to uh, measure the kilohertz. So however, it can go very low in frequency and actually similar technology is applied uh, for strain meter. So another area that actually fiber may very come to be uh, play a role in the earthquake community uh, at large is the fact uh, that uh, or you basically can go down to the DC or quasi DC strain meters and using the same uh, fiber. So the frequency band is very, is very large. And when I was talking about correlation was longer range uh, between uh, in the order of 5, 10, 20, 50 kilometers. I've seen some of uh, Jack Baker's publication in which but he has done some just statistical analysis and it seems very relevant estimating what will be the damage to single family homes and infrastructure based on those uh, longer range uh, correlation in one particular area. Let's say the Bay Area can be Los Angeles as well. And uh, the last thing that uh, I would like to say is that another correlation, but I don't know if that's what you might have it in mind, that is uh, the basics of seismic interferometry. So seismic interferometry is based on correlation between two different channels. And uh, uh, my group, and actually also uh, Rob Clayton at Caltech, has shown that we can use uh, traffic noise 
also up to 510 hertz to do uh, effective uh, inter seismic interferometry uh, using data that was collected in Long Beach using conventional seismometers to estimate the uh, soil properties in the first tens, hundreds of meters. And uh, uh, we have been looking at using the same things for the fiber and definitely is something that we are going to do more. I should say that a lot of the questions that you ask have to do with future work versus past. This experiment is absolutely was unique in the world as far as I can, I know, and it started one year and a half ago. So we still have to learn a really a lot of the potential. We do one last question and then it's lunch. lunch. So I'd like to piggyback on this idea of using, uh, incentivizing putting sensors with, bru with the, the brace and bolt. There you go, you get 3,000, but you have to install a sensor in. I mean, it seems now that the cost is so low, it would be a very nice incentive. And there's so many people who want uh, that $3,000. <laughs> I don't think you'll have a problem, and it's, uh, it shouldn't be detrimental to your yeah. program. Well, and we, we always have a dropout rate as well. We could go to those folks and say, um, would you like the, the uh, what is it called, the booby prize of a sensor in your house because you didn't retrofit? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I didn't say that. Um, oh, that's great. I love it. So thank you so much. It is, it is lunchtime.